In this video, we're going to start the mathematical derivation of gravitational waves by talking about linearized gravity, which is when we approximate the spacetime metric g as the flat Minkowski metric eta plus a small change h, where the components of h are much smaller than the components of eta, meaning they are much smaller than 1 in Cartesian coordinates. Over the next few videos, we'll see that gravitational waves are disturbances in this h term. So gravitational waves are essentially small vibrations in the metric, deviating away from flat spacetime. Our goal for this video is to calculate the form of all the terms on the left-hand side of the Einstein field equations, under the linearized gravity condition. This will involve calculating the inverse metric, the connection coefficients, the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci scalar. So before we start, I want to go over exactly what we mean by linearized gravity, also called weak gravity. I touched on this a little in my 108A video, but I was a bit sloppy and I'd like to correct myself. For linearized gravity, we write the metric g as the flat Minkowski metric eta in Cartesian coordinates, which is this matrix here, plus a small change h. When I say h is small, I mean that any term involving h squared is so extremely small that it can be neglected and set to zero. Now, there's another assumption of linearized gravity that is often left out of textbooks. And this is the assumption that the derivatives of h are also very small. This means that terms involving the derivative of h squared, or terms involving the product of h and the derivative of h, are extremely small and can be set to zero. I've almost never seen this property about the derivatives of h being small stated explicitly in most general relativity notes. But all the derivations I've seen in weak gravity seem to assume this property is true implicitly. So in my videos, I'm going to be working under the assumption that linearized gravity means h is small and the derivatives of h are small. So we know the metric g with lower indices is the Minkowski metric eta plus a small change h. The inverse metric with upper indices is basically the metric inverse of the metric matrix, which gives the 4x4 identity matrix, or Kronecker delta, when we multiply the metric and inverse metric together in a summation. We can assume the inverse metric G is the inverse Minkowski metric with upper indices, plus a different small change K with upper indices. If we plug these into this equation and distribute, we can replace the summation of the metric and the inverse metric with a Kronecker delta, and also replace this summation of the eta and inverse eta with a Kronecker delta, then cancel the Kronecker deltas. Since we know that the components of both h and k are small, the product of h and k should be extremely small, so we can ignore it. This leaves us with h eta inverse equaling negative eta k. If we sum both sides with eta inverse, on the left side, eta and eta inverse sum to a Kronecker delta, which changes this sigma index into a row index. So we've solved for the k components in terms of h components. k equals negative h, with two summations with the inverse Minkowski metric. Since the metric is used to raise and lower indices, we can treat these two Minkowski metrics as raising the mu and sigma indices on this h, giving us negative h with raised indices. So the inverse metric g is just the inverse Minkowski metric minus h with raised indices, where h with raised indices is just h with lowered indices summed with two inverse etas. It's important to remember that the metrics g and eta with upper indices are actually the inverse metrics, and some to give a Kronecker delta. But h with upper indices is not inverse h. Instead, h with upper indices is h with indices that have been raised with metric tensors. Normally we would raise indices with the g metric. But since h is small, the product of two h's goes to zero, 
so we can raise the indices of H using the eta metric only. Now let's calculate the connection coefficients using the standard formula involving the metric. We'll need to take partial derivatives of the metric G. This is really just taking the derivative of eta plus H, and since eta is constant, its derivative is zero. So for linearized gravity, the derivative of G can always be replaced by the derivative of H. And we can do that replacement in our connection coefficient formula. Now remember, the inverse metric G can be written as the inverse eta metric minus H with raised indices. If we distribute, you'll notice that we get several terms that are a product of H and the derivative of H. Remember, according to our linearized gravity condition, both H and the derivative of H are taken to be small. So their product is extremely small and can be ignored. So all these terms go to zero. So in linearized gravity, the connection coefficient formula looks like this. The derivatives of G are replaced by derivatives of H and the inverse g is replaced by an inverse eta. Now let's calculate the Riemann tensor. The formula for the Riemann tensor has two types of terms, the derivatives of the connection coefficients and products of the connection coefficients. Remember, the connection coefficient is made up of terms that contain the derivative of h. So when we multiply two connection coefficients together, we're going to get a series of terms that involve the product of two h derivatives. Again, in linearized gravity, we take the derivative of h to be small. This means that the product of two h derivatives is extremely small and can be ignored. So in linearized gravity, in the formula for the Riemann tensor, we ignore the terms involving products of the connection coefficients, because these are extremely small and can be ignored. So the Riemann tensor formula simplifies to the difference of two connection coefficient derivatives. If we sub in for the formulas for the connection coefficients, we can distribute the partial derivatives and pull the one half eta out in front, leaving us with six terms of two partial derivatives each. Since the order of partial derivatives doesn't matter, this partial mu partial nu term cancels with this partial nu partial mu term. So we're left with a formula with four terms. Next, we'll calculate the Ricci tensor, which is just the Riemann tensor with its upper and lower middle indices summed together. So to get the Ricci tensor, we'll take our Riemann tensor formula and change this upper index to a mu. This eta with upper mu alpha indices can raise all the alpha indices inside the brackets to upper mu's and raise the final mu to an alpha. Now, we already said in the last video that the d'Alembert operator, which is the square, is just two partial derivatives summed with the metric, or equivalently, a lower index partial summed with an upper index partial. Also, we're going to make a new definition called the h-scalar, which is the h components with one upper index and one lower index summed with itself. So this is sort of like the trace of the H matrix. So we can take these first two terms as they are, replace this with the d'Alembert operator, and replace this with the H scalar. And this gives us our formula for the Ricci tensor in linearized gravity. Finally, we'll look at the Ricci scalar, which is just the Ricci tensor with one raised index summed with itself, with the index being raised by eta. If we sub in our Ricci tensor formula, we can use the eta outside to raise all the new indices to become sigmas. This H tensor summed over itself can be rewritten as the scalar H. And two partial derivatives with raised and lowered indices can be rewritten as the square d'Alembert operator. And since we can always relabel summation indices wherever we like, as long as we relabel them consistently, we can relabel this alpha index with a sigma. So we're left with one half of two of the same term minus two of the same term. So we can just take one of each term and drop the one half. So the Ricci scalar in linearized gravity is the second partial derivative of H with raised indices minus the d'Alembertian of the H scalar. 
Now that we know the Ricci tensor, the metric tensor, and the Ricci scalar formulas for linearized gravity, we can get the formula for the Einstein tensor, capital G. We just plug all our formulas in. Again, since the G metric is really eta plus h, and the product of h with either h or a derivative of h is considered extremely small, we can ignore the h part of the metric here and just write the metric as eta. Distributing the eta for the last two terms and factoring one half from all six terms, we get this. Now here we have some h's with lowered indices, some with upper indices, and some with mixed indices. It's more convenient to have all of our h's with lowered indices. Since a raised index is really just a shorthand notation for a lowered index summed with an inverse metric, we can feel free to take a raised index, pop out the inverse metric, and then use it to raise the index of another term instead. So basically, it's acceptable to lower one index in a summation if we raise its partner index to compensate. So we can exchange these alphas, these alphas, and both alpha and beta here, and now all our h indices are lowered. Now it's possible to tidy up this expression by making a definition for the components h bar, which are the h components minus one half eta times the h scalar. Or alternatively, the h components equal the h bar components plus one half eta times the h scalar. So this is a bit messy, but we can sub in this new formula for the h components into our formula for the Einstein tensor. And we get one half times this set of six terms. We're going to show that these four terms with the h bars stick around but all the other terms cancel out with each other. If we look at the alpha mu derivatives acting on this term, this eta metric can lower the alpha derivative to a nu derivative. And looking at the alpha nu derivatives acting on this term, we can lower this alpha derivative to a mu derivative. These negative derivatives acting on this term we can leave as is. And for this term, we can use the alpha beta metric to lower this beta index to an alpha. So these two mu nu derivatives with the one half cancel with this negative mu nu derivative, and these two negative one half alpha alpha derivative terms cancel with this positive alpha alpha derivative term. So only the four h bar terms remain. So applying this definition of h bar to the six terms in the Einstein tensor, we can simplify the Einstein tensor to four terms with h bar. So for linearized gravity, the metric g is the Minkowski metric eta plus a small change h, where the derivatives of h are small. The inverse metric g is the inverse eta minus h with raised indices. We also have formulas for the connection coefficients, the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, the Ricci scalar, and using this definition for the h bar components, we have this formula for the Einstein tensor. We can now write the Einstein field equations for linearized gravity. In the next videos, we'll discuss how to pick a coordinate system in linearized gravity that make the existence of gravitational waves more obvious, where we can plainly see the metric tensor obeys the wave equation.